So this is our lesson for today. We have the first two letters to the churches of um, in Revelation. And the two churches are Ephesus and Smyrna. And when they would have gotten these letters, they would have gathered together and someone would have read them aloud. And when I was thinking about receiving these letters, it must have felt like report card season. And all I can think about, and I know some of you all have to remember, you got that sealed envelope and you had to hand it to your parents. And I always thought I knew what my grades were going to be, but my mind was still like, am I right? Are they, are they actually going to be on there? Did they change? And I got nervous. And so while I still questioned what it actually said, I was still surprised that I, st I knew what it was going to say. And so I'm sure the people were nervous about what God had to say to them because they knew that God knew their struggles and their weaknesses. And so in the face of opposition these churches were facing, this is actually a gift that Jesus gives directly to them. And we have to remember that Jesus died for the church and he loves her. And believers are his church, his body. And in caring for them, he's sending this message of encouragement and exhortation. So what about these seven churches? It's interesting that Jesus only addresses seven, but the number seven actually suggests completion. There were other prominent churches in the area, but they're not mentioned. So the number seven represents, at that time and ours, that struggles and failures and triumphs that we all will have, as well as encouragements, exhortations, and rebukes that we all can keep. So across these messages, Jesus is speaking to a full array of churches that are present and yet to come. And for the majority of the letters, we're gonna see a pattern. So the first is he addresses who it's written to, and then he makes a special identification of who he is. And it starts with, these are the words of. The third is encouragement. And the fourth is accusation or rebuke. And there's actually a few letters, like today, the letter to Smyrna, that doesn't have this section in it. And then the fifth is warning, and then finally, exhortation and promises. And I keep saying exhortation, but that's just a fancy word that he's strongly encouraging them or urging someone to do something about what they've heard. And so we see that when he says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So my outline, I have two, two sections. One is the letter to the Church of Ephesus, and then the second one is to the Church of Smyrna. Hopefully really simple today. My aim is living for Jesus in a hostile world requ requires persevering faith. And we're going to see that today in both of our letters, but you're also going to see that in all seven letters. All right, so when you get done writing that, if you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, we're going to get started. So the part that I love the most about these letters is before Jesus acknowledges any of the church's faith or gives them instructions, he establishes who he is. In each letter, he gives an aspect of who he is, his character, his power, and his purpose that is needed or applicable to the issue of that particular church. Verse 1 says, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven gold lampstands. And last week, we read that Jesus was in the midst of the lampstands in 1.13. But here in 2.1, it says that he's walking amongst them. There's action now. And walking amongst them means that he sees everything, that there's an intimacy in that, and he is amongst them. So if he's amongst them, that means he knows everything. He knows the good and the bad, and he knows what needs to be encouraged and affirmed, and then what needs to be confronted. These past three weeks, we've been setting a foundation of who God is 
and how he can be trusted. Our lessons have asked us multiple different ways of how we can have confidence in who he says he is. We've looked up so many verses, Old Testament and New Testament, of how God is trustworthy and how he's in control. So when we see that he's in the middle of these lampstands, this gives us a concept that we can wrap our minds around because we can see the intimacy that Jesus has with his believers. He knew what each church needed and sent these specific messages to them. And just like today, Jesus is among us, among his people, and he knows what we face as we walk through this world. So just to give you some emphasis or some background on Ephesus, the city of Ephesus was the largest and most important city in Asia Minor. We could compare it to places like London, Hong Kong, or even New York of today. So the city was, cult was a cultural and tourist hub. And at the time, it controlled major seaports. So religiously, Ephesus was the primary center of worship for the goddess Diana, but it was also a pluralistic society. So many religions were practiced there. However, this pluralism threatened Christ's church with confusion and untruth. And that's similar to what we see today. Our world is proliferated with a great deal of true and false information. And it takes careful discernment to sort it out rightly. So rich in culture and industry, Ephesus was the nearest of the cities to the island of Patmos, which we learned that's where John is. So logistically, it makes sense that the first letter is written to them and they would travel to the next church, which is known to be Smyrna. And actually in your books, you have a really cool map that lays them all out. So you should take a look at that. The church of Ephesus was actually an awesome church and it was blessed to actually have the apostle Paul, John and Timothy all teach there. Paul actually taught there for about three years. And we even see in the book of Ephesus that Paul writes to them after his time with them, commending of them of their faithfulness in expanding their ministry. Jews and Gentiles were all coming together in a united faith. So the Ephesian church was well taught. Verses two and three tell us they had doctrinal discernment. They knew God's truth and worked hard and were committed to make sure that the true gospel message was known. But they were missing an essential piece, love. While teaching truth is absolutely vital, teaching that truth with the right motivation is just as necessary. Where there's a lack of love and passion for Christ, there's a lack of love for people. And that matters because love opens hearts so they can hear and receive the truth. Love is also what motivates a heart and demonstrates that truth is real. So both truth and love are crucial to an effective witness. So this is where G in verse four, Jesus is going to tell them what they're missing. It says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So forsaken is not a, no a normal word that we use. Well, at least not for me. I don't go around saying you've forsaken something. And when I looked into this word, it actually really packs a heavy punch. Other places in scripture, it's actually been used in the context of divorce. So Jesus is saying that they have divorced themselves from their first love. They started out loving Jesus, loving his word, loving each other, and loving being a part of the change that his gospel makes in their lives. But somewhere along the way, something changed. This is a familiar phrase, but they drifted. They abandoned their love for God and consequently their love for others. They don't love Jesus the way they used to. They love truth, but they lost their love for Jesus. 
This is really hard. And I had to ask myself how or why. And perhaps cynicism crept in or differencing of opinions within the church or competing agendas crowd their love for each other. Maybe they began to love being right more than they loved being a conduit of grace and mercy. Or maybe they became so focused on the truth of the gospel that their love and wonder diminished. Jesus knew the true affection of their hearts and told them exactly what they needed to do. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. That's a big thing, removing your lampstand. So they needed to remember the deep love and passion when they first believed. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the God, love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the Ephesians had a whole love chapter written to them in Ephesians. So this love problem wasn't new to them. So the Ephesians didn't have a mind problem. They knew truth, but they had a disconnect between their mind and their heart. And when we think about what the world says about love, it's something that you can fall into or out of. And something that does, if something doesn't excite you or satisfy you any longer, you can just move on to the next thing. But as Christ followers, we love because God loved us first. And he is our source of true love. What were you like when you first loved Jesus? I was a junior in college and I had a major moment where I could either run towards him or run away. And during that spring semester, I made the decision to foster my love for him. I could not get enough of his word. It was a delight to spend time with him and I wanted to get as much of his word from my head to my heart as possible. But as the years have passed, it's been hard to keep up that same vigor and passion. And I get stuck on trying to do my spiritual checklist. And I don't want you to hear that spiritual habits are bad because they're actually wonderful. And they teach us discipline and they help us connect to God in our worship of him. But what happened to the Ephesians and what can happen to us is we get focused on the wrong thing. And I start to understand theology behind my faith, but I forget the reality of it. And I know I can't be alone in this room because I've heard it at church and at BSF, that we can all treat our quiet time and our worship and even our BSF lesson like a chore instead of a treat. And here's where God Jesus is speaking to us today, and he's telling us that it's a gift to dive into his word so that it ignites our passion for him. And growing to love rightly requires time with God, in his word, in prayer, and with his people. And if we do not nurture our love for God, it grows cold, and we no longer see the world around us the way he does. We'll just go through the motions of Christian practices without putting our heart into the activity. So here's my first principle. Living for Jesus means loving and serving him wholeheartedly. Living for Jesus means loving and serving him wholeheartedly. So the question I have for you today is, has your love for God grown cold? And how might the fact that God's love for you never changes move you to express your love for him more consistently and constantly? I love how in each one of these letters, he doesn't end with 
Um, he doesn't end without a blessing to each of the churches. So in verse 7, Jesus makes this promise to the faithful. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so, like I said, the beginning is specific to the church, and so is the blessing is specific to the church. So this victorious, so the victorious will eat from the tree of life. And the Ephesians would have known this reference. Remember, they're really well known. They know their scripture. And this was an Old Testament reference. It was last seen in the Garden of Eden, and it represents eternal life. So those who eat of it will live forever. And someone who's way more wise than me said this, but it was so great I had to share. So the tree of life is in the beginning of our Bibles and Adam and Eve were banished from it after they rebelled. But Jesus is revealing it in the last book of the Bible, which he then makes it available through his victory on the cross to those who put their faith in him. Full circle, ladies. That is awesome. So I just encourage you, don't give up your first love. All right, now we're going to go to our second division. And this is the letter to the Church of Smyrna. And switching gears just a little bit, Jesus identifies himself with the first and the last and who died and came to life. And so that's what the Spirit told John to write down specifically for the church in Smyrna. And when we discover what Jesus has, has to say to them, we understand why he identifies himself this way. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. There's a lot in there. And we're going to unpack that in just a minute, but... I want to talk about what is the Church of Smyrna, just like I talked about the Church of Ephesus. So we learned in our lesson that the Church of Smyrna is suffering, and they are spiritually rich because they are joined with Christ, but they are financially poor. Because of their allegiance to Christ, it's prevented them from fully participating in the professional and business community in Smyrna. And many were disinherited by their families. And the Jews were spreading lies about them, saying that they were seeking to usher in a new kingdom at the expense of the Romans. And because of this, the Romans didn't want to do business with anyone who was a part of this church. Smyrna's society was very similar to Ephesus. It was cosmopolitan in nature and filled with multiple religions. But beyond that, its greatest allegiance was to Rome. And Jesus knows their afflictions and their poverty and their slander against them. And he says, despite that, your wealth is in spiritual riches, like fellowship and peace with Christ and joy and love for one another. So with the church suffering, as much as it was, I bet that some of the hearers of this letter were hoping we got, the, we got our way out. Jesus is going to tell us how he's going to end our suffering. But instead, he says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. But be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So there's a lot in those, in that ver in those verses, so I just want to break it down. At the beginning, we see that he says, do not be afraid. And when I see that, everything in my humanist says, I'm afraid. But he knows that, and that's what he's telling us. Do not be afraid. Because, like we know, and I've said, I cannot say enough in this lecture, he knows about their trials. And he knows about our trials. And he knows their lives intimately. And he knows our lives intimately. Because believers are in his hands. 
And we don't have to fear because he's already won. He defeated the greatest enemy, which is death. And he said at the beginning of this letter that he was the one who died and came to life again. His resurrection assures the resurrection of all believers. And it means that we don't have to fear death because we have something greater in life with Jesus. So the tricky part, the next tricky part is when he mentions Satan. And I just wanted to kind of understand this part together. So our Christian battles are really not with people. Our battle is against the enemy. And he entices people against Jesus and against his church. So it's, our battle is actually a spiritual battle. And we battle for people to bring them to Christ by teaching truth and showing love, even in the face of our suffering, afflictions, poverty, and slander. And so I had to ask myself, if this is a spiritual battle, then why isn't Jesus lifting the pressure? Isn't he the one who's in control? And of course, he's the one in control. We see that he is sovereign over all. But he tells them to persevere and doesn't change their situation. And I can't be the only one who is asking why. Because in our lives, when we're facing persecution or suffering, we ask why. But here it shows that he's molding and shaping his church and he's producing through them a powerful witness of truth. It's a rich fragrance of loving devotion for their savior that is revealed. And I keep saying the word affliction a lot, and the Greek for this actually means a crushing, relentless pressure. And that's actually fitting because Smyrna means myrrh, which produces a fragrant or a perfume. But you get that fragrance by piercing or crushing the bark of the flowering myrrh tree. So when it's crushed, it emits a rich fragrance. And Smyrna is a church that is under pressure. It's being crushed. And out of that intense pressure is coming a rich fragrance of spiritual fragrance, a rich spiritual fragrance. And this is the role of this church, a commitment to loving and serving and speaking to others, even in persecution. Personally, our endurance to the end demonstrates that we are truly his. Those who persevere in their faith will receive the victor's crown. That's his promise to them. He's not saying that you'll earn it, but he's saying that that's what is in store for those who are truly his. So we can trust and take courage that when what we know is lasting and true and accomplished, the resurrection of Jesus speaks to us to bring the ult sorry, the resurrection Jesus speaks of brings to the ultimate life where sin and pain and suffering are removed and where we are eternally with our Savior. That's the victor's crown. And while we can understand a picture of what the crown is, again, there's no mistake of why Jesus says a victor's crown to Smyrna, because this is a meaningful picture to these people. Their city sat against a hill in which several pagan temples were on, and against the skyline, they looked like a crown. It was actually called the crown of Smyrna. And this was a source of pride for the city. But Jesus here is offering a far superior crown, a lasting crown, which will be theirs as their faith is revealed through their perseverance. In our persecution and suffering in our life, how we respond to it and how we 
go about our pain and our injustice and tragedies of our life, this shows who we glorify in it. Any kind of suffering for what is right and true gives us the opportunity to glorify our Savior. And this is a sobering message to the church in Smyrna and to the present church today. They should expect to be put to death for their allegiance to him. But speaking as the one who died and came to life, Jesus assured them that being put to death would not be the end of their story. And this brings us to our second Bible principle, which is Jesus calls his followers to endure suffering with faithfulness. Jesus calls his followers to endure suffering with faithfulness. When the day comes that every person who has died is called to life, to stand before him in the final judgment, the day when all humanity is divided either into eternal punishment or eternal life, they can be assured to enter into eternal life. And God has promised that the end of this temporal life is not the end of the story for them or for us. It is the beginning of a true life in the presence of God. So we're not to fear our first death, though none of us are going to look forward to that, but it's inevitable. But we don't have to fear the possibility of that second death, life without the presence of God among us. Is it possible that we cherish this life too much? Do we cling to this first life as though it's the only life that we'll experience? Is this life not the passage to the real life? If we answer any of these questions with the right mindset, then we don't have to be afraid and can settle into the purpose that God has given to us directly. For the Church of Smyrna, they faced severe uncertainty and immense hostility. But how they handled it is what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. They don't have to look inward or outward, but they look upward. So I have to ask us, and I'm asking myself this as well. Where is my focus in troubled times? Is it on the God who is absolutely sovereign and all-powerful, as well as all-caring? Or is it upon my circumstances? I encourage us, if we look upward, we will receive the victor's crown. So are you ready? Ready for the next world at whatever the costs of your faith it may require. There is no greater treasure than Christ, and there is no greater worth, sorry, there is no greater witness worth enduring. Jesus asked a profound question in Luke 18, 8, that says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And I believe that the answer is yes. He will find faith on earth because he loves his church. He died for her and he leads her and he speaks to her and, he res and she responds with faith. And that's us. And on an individual basis, will Jesus find faith in you and me? This whole lesson had me thinking, what makes a lasting, impactful, enduring witness? What makes for a well-lived life and a good and faithful servant? I think Jesus has made it clear. A life devoted to loving him first and holding an eternal perspective. 
Make Christ your treasure. Nurture your love for him. And that love will fuel your faith and fortify for an enduring witness. Let's pray. Dear God, I praise you for your truth that was written to a real persevering church and how your truth is living and it's just as impactful and real to us today. Lord, I pray that this Bible study isn't just a place where we can come and know the right answers, but that it impacts our heart and impacts our life for you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is in each discussion, that women can be open and honest about their true, for, or about their first love. In Jesus' name, amen.